Good afternoon. I'm Patrick Lewis, the Director of Collections and Research at the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad that you're able to join us for today's presentation, Old, New, Borrowed, Blue, Examining Wedding Dresses and Bridal Traditions. I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Brooks Vessels, the Museum Collections Assistant at the Filson. Brooks received her BFA from the University of Louisville's Height Art Institute with concentrations in printmaking and fiber. Since 2018, she has worked with museum curator Maureen Lane on the inventory, assessment, and preservation of the thousands of artifacts in the Filson's clothing and textile collections. And Brooks really has transformed my understanding of the Filson's collection and has greatly enhanced our ability to interpret the lives of women in the Ohio Valley. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. Please join me in welcoming Brooks Vessels. Good afternoon. Um, as Patrick said, uh, my name is Brooks Vessels and I'm the Museum Collections Assistant here at the Wilson Historical Society. Uh, I'm so excited to spend some time with you all today talking about one of the hidden treasures in the Filson's extensive archives. In addition to our rare books, photographs, and manuscripts, we also have a large museum collection containing everything from dresses and cookware to firearms and tools. Filson has been collecting clothing and textiles since the 19-teens and has thousands of pieces in the collection. The collection has sat largely untouched for the last few decades, so when museum curator Maureen Lane and I began inventorying the collection, we had no idea how many unique pieces we would come across. As Patrick mentioned, we've been working on the inventory for about three and a half years now, and we're only maybe two thirds of the way through the collection, so it is massive. Um, because we just started inventorying the collection just a few years ago, we haven't had a chance to put many of these pieces on display. So you are actually uh, some of the first people that will get to see many of these pieces in like almost 30 years. Um, the clothing and textile collection holds a special place in my heart. I've been fascinated with historic clothing for as long as I can remember and getting to work with these pieces every day has only made me love them more. We have approximately 50 wedding dresses in our collection from as early as the 18 teens spanning all the way to the 1960s. And I do say approximately because we're conducting inventory and it's very possible that we'll find some more wedding dresses along the way. I wanted to focus on the wedding dresses in our collection because these garments reflect not only the fashion trends of their time, but the position of women within society. For much of history, few options were available for women outside the confines of marriage, as young girls were typically educated in the art of housekeeping and child rearing above all else. The act of marriage was also one of the few areas of her life that a woman had some control over. While men would propose a union, it was ultimately up to the woman to accept his offer and that choice would determine what kind of life the woman wanted to have and what role she wanted to fulfill within her community. The wedding ceremony was a ritual that often marked the transition of a bride from girlhood to womanhood. Married women played completely different roles in society. They had more freedom to move throughout their communities. They took control of a new household. And even the kind of clothing and jewelry worn by married women was completely different from what was available to unmarried girls. Girls were typically allowed to wear pale colors, while married women had more freedom to wear bright colors and patterns and some more extravagant jewelry. According to historian Edward Westermark, couples preparing for marriage were thought to be in danger of interference or attack by evil spirits as they began the transition from single to married life. Many wedding rituals have arisen from this belief, some of which are still practiced today. However, these wedding traditions have evolved numerous times over the years, so there's rarely just one reason why a specific wedding ritual is carried out. For example, many believe that a bride wearing a veil over her face during a wedding ceremony is meant to represent her purity and chastity, and that may be true for some, but um, the tradition actually gained popularity in the U.S. in the early 19th century due to a renewed interest in ancient Greco-Roman culture when veils were purely fashionable. The, super, the superstition, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, is one that many brides still follow today. But where did it come from, and what are these objects supposed to do? The oldest written reference to this rhyme is from an 1871 issue of St. James Magazine out of Lancashire, England. It also includes the line in a sixpence in your shoe, but I imagine that that part of the tradition was cut out pretty early 
I mean, most brides wear heels on their wedding day and that's already really uncomfortable. So having a coin in there would not make the experience any more pleasant. Uh, over the course of the next hour, I'll be breaking down the meaning of this ritual by looking at some examples of dresses in our collection that fit each line of the rhyme. We'll also be looking at several important cultural events and technological advancements that have impacted the evolution of wedding dresses and wedding culture. Like most other superstitions, the reasoning behind something old varies depending on who you ask. Some believe that carrying something old, particularly something that belongs to another woman in the family or a family heirloom, is meant to ward off the evil eye, which was thought to cause infertility. It's also believed that a bride something old was supposed to re represent the best part of a woman's life before marriage with the intention of bringing those habits with her to married life. This wedding dress is the oldest garment in the Filson's clothing and textile collection. It was worn by Mary Eleanor Braden at her wedding to Zachariah Delaney on March 1st, 1816. The wedding was held at Mary's family estate in Waterford, Virginia. Getting married at the bride's family home was very common, particularly in the first half of the 19th century. Weddings at this time were a private family affair and there was no need to reserve a large church. Depending on the part of the country where the wedding took place, there may not have been a church nearby and the family would have had to travel a long distance to a neighboring parish. So sticking with the family home just made the most sense. While this dress does fit our normal expectations of the white wedding dress, that may be more by coincidence than intent. Fashion in the Regency or Federalist period was heavily influenced by ancient Greek and Roman culture. Simple empire style gowns made of thin gauzy fabrics in really pale colors and in white were what was most fashionable at this time. So this gown could have just as easily been an evening gown as a wedding dress. And as I mentioned earlier, even the classic lace veil, which I have pictured in the middle image was just a popular accessory for evening wear during this period. So I feel like I need to explain why there are two white dresses in the screen and which one is the wedding dress. The larger image on the left is Mary's wedding dress and the dress in the middle image was either a chemise or a nightgown. Because women in this time period wanted to look like Greek and Roman goddesses, all their clothing was really thin and actually looked a lot like what we would imagine 19th century undergarments to look like. When you see the two dresses in person, it is a little bit easier to differentiate the two. The chemise is made of a really thin cotton and the wedding dress is made of silk, but this is just like a very standard um, silhouette for the time period, which I thought was interesting. In addition to the dress and the chemise, we also have Mary's wedding veil, her slippers, and her fan, which would have all been part of Mary's trousseau. And you may want to remember this dress and the woman who wore it, as she'll be coming up again a little bit later on. I've also include a fashion, included a fashion plate from 1820 to give you a better idea of how this garment would have looked on the bride. Unfortunately, if we were able to have had this program in person, I could have brought some of these dresses out for you. But since that isn't possible right now, I'm including some additional reference images just so you could get the full effect of the design. Something new is symbolic of a new chapter of life the couple is about to enter. For much of the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, couples didn't live together before marriage, and they were responsible for making or purchasing a variety of items to bring to their new life. In addition to her wedding dress, a bride and her family had to assemble her wedding trousseau in preparation for the big day. A trousseau is made up of all the soft goods a woman would need to furnish her home, while the groom was responsible for purchasing a house and all the accompanying furniture. These soft goods would include everything from linen, bedding, towels, handkerchiefs, as well as a complete wardrobe for the woman that would last for at least the first year of her marriage. And this is a task that was carried out in varying degrees depending on the economic status of the couple and the bride's family. Many brides were able to make the garments and textiles in their trousseaus by hand, but by the latter half of the 19th century, local dressmakers and department stores began specializing in the creation of custom wedding dresses and wedding trousseaus. Many, depart uh, many department stores offered reasonably priced options for brides and the novelty of purchasing a wedding dress and accompanying trousseaus was an indication that the bride was a member of the growing American middle class. So it was very much a status symbol to be able to say that you purchased your dress from a department store. 
That being said, um, a reasonably priced trousseau for a middle-class bride in the 1880s would have cost around $200, which is about $5,000 today. And you know, you may think like, oh, that sounds like a lot of money, but I'm sure her friends chipped in and helped pay for it, kind of like how we have bridal showers today. But actually, wedding gifts were rarely meant to be practical in the mid 19th century. If a woman was close to the bride, they would maybe give her an embroidered handkerchief or a lace collar or something else like that. But giving a bride a practical gift like bedding or cookware or a petticoat or something would have implied that the bride's family wasn't able to provide for her on their own. And it was almost seen as like an insult. So it was entirely on the shoulders of the family to be able to put together the trousseau. This wedding dress and the, um, the trousseau dress belonged to Angie Bell Grinstead and she married William Milton Vaughn on December 13th, 1882. Both her wedding dress and trousseau dress were purchased at Clothes and Lawson, a department store in Louisville um, that ran from 1880 to 1882. As you can see from the fashion plate in the middle from an 1877 issue of Godey's Ladies Book, the silhouette of the wedding dress and the trousseau dress are very similar. Throughout the 19th century, wedding dresses were designed in the same style as both day and evening wear, so the silhouettes are very much the same. So while we only have one garment from Angie's trousseau, I wanna give you all a better idea of what else she would have worn to give this dress its proper shape. So she would have worn under all of these, clothing, um, these garments, stockings, a chemise, drawers, a corset, a corset cover, an under petticoat, a crinoline cage or bustle, a decorative petticoat, and then her dress hat and other accessories would be added. Women didn't have as many outer garments as we do today, but they had a variety of undergarments that were essential parts of their wardrobe. These undergarments were meant to protect the outer garments from sweat, and the wearer would launder the undergarments frequently, but they'd rarely wash their outer garments as the fabric was too delicate for regular washings. So when you think about how many elements there were to ladies' dress during the Victorian era, it makes the act of creating a trousseau even more daunting and impressive. The wedding dress on the left and the trousseau dress on the right belonged to Lizzie Eleanor Delaney, who married Judson C. Clements on December 2nd, 1886. The dresses were designed by Madame Elizabeth Doherty, who was one of the most popular dressmakers in Louisville during the 1880s. She was best known for creating extravagant bridal gowns and trousseaus. And according to an article in the Louisville Times, she employed as many as 100 women to help her create these pieces. You can definitely tell by looking at the dresses that Madame Doherty put a lot of thought and attention into the pieces that she made. The green trousseau dress is made of a thick moss green velvet and came with a matching muff as this dress was meant to be worn in the winter months. And yes, the fabric is as soft as it looks. Uh, this velvet is one of the most luxurious fabrics that I've ever gotten to handle. And the front of the dress has a large panel of paisley embroidery that really perfectly accents the velvet fabric, and it gives it both a stylish and tasteful um, overall appearance. And as you can see from the small image in the middle of the screen, um, Madame Doherty signed, put like a garment tag inside her name and all of the pieces that she created. Now you may notice that Lizzie's wedding dress is a little bit unusual. I don't typically associate hot pink velvet with bridal wear, but the trimmings that were added to her neck the waistline and the skirt weren't original. When the dress was first made, it was trimmed with wax flower garlands. And according to a letter from Lizzie's daughter, it was similar to what was worn by Mrs. Cleveland when she married the president the same year. Lizzie had the dress altered in 1892 so she could wear it to a formal dinner given by President Harrison at the White House. This practice of modifying and re-wearing a wedding dress was very common throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. Many women would have their dresses trimmed in wax orange blossoms and delicate lace for their wedding day, but would remove the trimmings and replace them with something more appropriate for evening wear after the ceremony. Some women would even have two bodices made for her wedding dress, one for the ceremony and a more casual one for a typical evening gown. Women in the British aristocracy would wear their wedding dresses when presented at court. The women would have the long sleeves removed and their neckline lowered, and a special court train made out of velvet would be added to the skirt. So in a way, 
Lizzie Delaney's attendance at the White House dinner was very similar to her, uh, a presentation at court. Um, you can tell by the way that her daughter wrote about Mrs. Cleveland that the president and first lady were as close as you could get to royalty in America at this time. Something borrowed usually refers to a token or garment borrowed from a woman in the bride's family who's happily married. Like something old, this object was thought to bring good luck and a happy marriage to the bride-to-be. The women of the Nelson family took this element of the rhyme to heart. Um, this modern looking sleeveless dress was worn by at least four different women over the course of 70 years. The dress was made by Madame Glover, who is another well-respected Louisville dressmaker for the wedding of Theodosia George Nelson on March 9, 1910. The dress was worn again by Theodosia's descendants in 1934, 1953, and 1979. The dress was allegedly worn by two other women in the family between 1953 and 1979, uh, but their names weren't recorded in any existing documents in our collection, so I wasn't able to get that info for you. Um, the dress was also um, very close to being destroyed in 1974 when a tornado ripped the roof off of the attic where the dress was being stored. And I imagine that Helen Nelson, who wore the dress in 79, is very grateful that the dress was able to survive that um, brush with death. <laughs> and as the dress was handed through the, down through the family, each bride modified the dress to fit her own personal taste. As I'm sure you could imagine, a sleeveless dress with a sweetheart neckline wouldn't exactly be appropriate in 1910. And so um, you can see that it went through several evolutions over the course of its life. Lace collars were added and removed, and by 1979, the sleeves had been taken off completely. And although the dress no longer contains any historic value as an example of early 20th century clothing, its evolution is a testament to the symbolism and sentimental nature of the garment. This wedding dress was one of the first pieces we found when we started inventorying the collection in 2018, and it's still one of my favorites. It was worn by Virginia Anderson when she married William Bullitt on May 31st, 1837. 108 years later, the dress was worn by Virginia's great granddaughter, Dorothea Hutchings Donnelly, at her first wedding to Paxton Price on October, August 25th, 1945. Unlike the Nelsons, Dorothea didn't change anything about the design of the dress. All she did from, according to our records, is let the waist back out to its original size, which was another indication that um, other women in the family may have worn the dress in that 108 year span between those, the two brides we know of. An article published in the Courier Journal the day after the wedding described the antique dress in great detail, emphasizing the timeless beauty of the original design. So while I couldn't find any folklore specifically about wearing another woman's wedding dress, it was clearly an important tradition that's been carried out by many women over hundreds of years. I find this dress to be extra impressive because it was made before the invention of the sewing machine. And it's a little bit hard to see here, but the entire dress is covered in hand embroidered flowers. So every part of the dress was hand stitched and I can't imagine how long that must have taken to make. While we don't have the actual dress pictured here in our collection, I thought these photographs were important to include as they're the only known photos in our collection that depict two women wearing the same wedding dress. The dress was first worn by Aileen Morin at her wedding to Benjamin Duke Choate on November 7th, 1911, and it was also designed by Madame Glover. Aileen's daughter, Ella, wore the dress at her wedding to Field and Woodward on September 7th, 1938. So the dress doesn't appear to have been modified. The way that the two women styled the dress is an indication of the evolving fashion trends between the two generations. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, it was considered inappropriate for women to show her bare arms in church, which is why Eileen is depicted wearing full length gloves with only about an inch of her arm exposed between her glove and her sleeve. In the photograph of Ella on the right, you can see that she's abandoned the gloves and the weird bonnet cage-like headdress that her mom wore in favor of a more uh, modern headband and veil, which added a little bit of glamor to the dress. These photographs help us imagine the different ways that the Nelson and Bullet dresses were styled by each new bride. And while you can tell that the two women are wearing the same dress, the overall effect of the look is completely different.
like something old, wearing something blue on your wedding day was meant to ward off the evil eye. And the color was also symbol symbolic of true love and fidelity. This wedding dress made of blue silk, brocade and blue fringe was worn by Wilhelmina Schuckman at her wedding to John Schunicht on October 25th, 1857. While superstition may have played some role in her choosing to wear a blue wedding dress, she likely picked the garment for some more practical reasons. Wilhelmina and John were both first generation immigrants to the United States, traveling from Germany and Prussia respectively. John was a master cabinet maker and both parties were likely members of the working middle class. Many lower and middle class women couldn't afford the expense of purchasing a traditional white satin wedding dress. White dresses were notoriously difficult to keep clean and any imperfections in the construction of the dress would have been really visible on white fabric. So instead women would purchase, uh, either purchase a new dress that could be worn again to church or to other social gatherings, or they would just wear the nicest dress that they had in their wardrobe and then add maybe like a little bit of lace or a wax flower garland for the occasion to just make it feel a little bit more special. And while we'll, never, while we'll never know for sure, I like to think that Wilhelmina was being both practical and stylish by choosing this color palette. Blue was a really fashionable color for men's wedding attire for the last two centuries. And the neckerchief pictured here was part of John, her husband's wedding suit. So, you know, maybe she just wanted to color coordinate with her future husband and that's why she decided to wear blue. We'll never know. <laughs> So for the remainder of our time, I'll be focusing on some major social and cultural events and technological advancements that had a direct impact on the evolution of wedding dresses and wedding culture. While white wedding dresses were worn in the 18th and early 19th centuries by members of the upper middle class and the British aristocracy, they were really the standard across all economic backgrounds until Queen Victoria wore the dress pictured here at her wedding to Prince Albert on February 10th, 1840. Traditionally, royal brides would have worn a long purple or red velvet robe of state and a tiara to her wedding ceremony. But Queen Victoria wanted her dress to reflect her role as a future wife rather than a future ruler. The young monarch opted for this white satin court dress with lace trim and a veil pinned to, artificial, to an artificial wreath of orange blossoms that was in her hair. Royal weddings in the 19th century weren't public affairs but reports and sketches of the ceremony were quickly circulated throughout the country. Queen Victoria's choice to wear a white wedding dress instead of ceremonial royal garments made her more relatable to her subjects. Women all over the country and much of the Western world wanted to dress just like the queen for their wedding day, and now they could. Um, around 1840, white wedding dresses became the norm for brides of all economic and social backgrounds. The color became symbolic in this context for romantic love and purity. The use of orange blossoms in wedding attire also grew in popularity as a plant could produce the bud, the fruit, and the bloom of the orange all at once. And that was seen as kind of the ultimate symbol of purity and fertility. Um, so those two are kind of staples of wedding dresses, particular, particularly through the rest of the 19th century. The invention of the sewing machine has a long sordid history with the first known designs dating back to the late 18th century. I could fill another hour just talking about the evolution of the sewing machine. Um, it has so much information and such a huge like wealth of material, material to pull from that I had to kind of pare it back to make sure that I stayed relevant to what we were talking about today. Um, I'll just say that there were a lot of, there was a ton of patent infringement going on and patent lawsuits. And a few of the inventors of early models of the sewing machine ended up dying in poor houses. Numerous inventors tried their hand at creating a machine that would rival the hand stitching of an accomplished seamstress, but it wasn't until the 1850s that a viable design hit the market. Isaac Singer patented his sewing machine in 1851, but had to pay royalties to a handful of inventors who owned the rights to specific mechanisms within his design. For instance, Elias Howe created the, the sewing machine needle, which was a special design that had the eye of the needle right next to the point, which is what you see on sewing machines today. So every time Isaac Singer sold a sewing machine using that needle, he had to pay Elias Howe. 
But by 1856, Singer convinced seven other inventors to go in on the first patent pool in the United States, saving all of them copious amounts of time and money that had been wasted on patent litigations. Clothing manufacturers were the first to employ the sewing machine, but by the 1860s, there were a variety of cost-effective machines on the market, and the sewing machine became a staple in most middle-class households. By, 18, by the year 1860, more than 110 sewing machines had been manufactured in the United States alone. While much of the detail work done on garments such as evening dresses and wedding dresses was still done by hand, the, machine, the sewing machine could stitch large quantities of fabric together in record time, which may have influenced the changing silhouette of the period. In the 1850s and 1860s, the crinoline cage or hoop skirt was at the height of its popularity and several yards of fabric were needed to make the massive skirts that would cover the cages. With the sewing machine, one of these skirts could be constructed in only an hour or two, while it would have taken more than triple the time to sew it by hand. This dress worn by Wilhelmina Crawford at her marriage to Benjamin Bayless on October 20th, 1870 is an excellent example of the use of both hand and machine sewing. The massive skirt and train are approximately six feet long by six feet wide, and almost the entirety of the skirt is machine sewn. As you can see from this detail shot of the lining of the bodice, most of the bodice was constructed using a sewing machine. The pattern for the bodice was very complex and included several rows of either whalebone or strips of steel boning, creating a sort of second corset within the dress. So the women would have worn garments similar to what I mentioned earlier in their full corset, which would have at least 20 rows of either whalebone or steel, and then have this extra like 12 um, rows of boning on top of that. And I've actually made a corset using a pattern from this time period, and I cannot fathom how long it would take to sew all of those boning channels by hand. It was quite a feat. <laughs> so while the majority of the dress was constructed on a sewing machine, the waistband of the skirt and the lace detailing across the neckline were stitched by hand, as you can kind of see along the bottom of the photo and along the top neckline, you can see some of the hand stitching. And um, this was done because the sewing machine wasn't capable of producing that level of detail and precision that was needed to add those finishing touches. And this combination of both hand and machine sewing is something that we see across many of the dresses in our collection. No matter the size of a wedding today, you're guaranteed to see a photographer or two fluttering around the wedding party and the guests snapping dozens of photos to commemorate the big day. This is actually a relatively new practice. Up until the late 19th century, very few photos of brides existed. Sitting for a photograph was time consuming and expensive, and couples would have to squeeze in a stop at the photographer's studio between the ceremony and the reception if they wanted to have a photo taken. As the equipment was uh, too cumbersome to bring on location, it really was the only option that they had. Um, later on, photographers were able to like find some smaller equipment that they could bring, but for a lot of the 19th century, the only option was to make that extra stop. By the late 1920s and 1930s, photographers had devised a model for wedding photography that's similar to what we see today. They would bring a large camera for staged shots of the couple and the bridal party, and a small one that would be carried through the crowd for some more candid shots. These photographs better help us better understand the evolution of bridal fashion, as you can see through these images. This dress was worn by Melvilla Emmett Carter at her wedding on November 6th, 1894, and it looks very plain in the image on the right. As we discussed, many women had their wedding dresses modified after the ceremony. So without this photograph, we would have no idea that the garment on the right was once adorned with copious amounts of lace and pearl beading. And I inventoried this dress at least a year before I saw the photo. And um, I was very familiar with it, spent a lot of time studying it during inventory. And when I saw the photo, I was like, we don't have that dress in our collection. There's no way I would remember that lace. I'd remember the weird, um, rhinestone belt that she has around her waist. Like this looks completely different. 
And it took a little while for me to realize like, oh, this was the same dress. Cool, okay. <laughs> so the same can be said for the this wedding dress, which was worn by Melville's daughter, Melville. She wore this cropped slim fitting satin wedding dress when she married Russell Briney on April 17th, 1926. While the dress itself is very modern, the long tiered lace veil gave her a more traditional appearance in these photographs. And it even hid the fact that she was wearing a knee length dress. And similar to the last photo, um, I was shocked that we had this dress in our collection. I was sure that we hadn't inventoried it before, but I inventoried this dress at the same time that I inventoried the previous one. And when I saw this, I was like, I guess this is a women's dress, but like it's definitely not a wedding dress. I'm sure the records like are wrong or something because it has no beading on it. It has no extra flair to it. And it's a short wedding dress. Like I'm sure they didn't do that in the 1920s. And it was only through studying this and getting to see the, um, the way that the veil is positioned on her head and all the trailing ribbons from the floral bouquet and the really extravagant veil that I figured out like, oh, okay, this is a wedding dress. But it's those kind of elements that we lose through inventory and through um, just studying the extant garments because we don't have these additional context clues. So the United States involvement in World War II led to a dramatic increase in young American couples tying the knot. According to a 1943 article in Bride's Magazine, as many as 80% of grooms were in the armed forces. The ever-present threat of being sent off to war led to a flurry of wedding ceremonies that were planned in just a few weeks' time. As many of these weddings were planned around enlistment dates and trips overseas, procuring a wedding dress for the ceremony was sometimes impossible. Many women would either wear the best dress that they owned, or they would purchase one from a local department store. Many department stores sold wedding suits in lieu of a traditional wedding dress, and that would consist of a simple mid-length dress and a matching jacket and sometimes a matching hat. Uh, brides-to-be would often pin flowers to their suits and then wear the hat and maybe add some gloves or something to try to make the ensemble feel a little bit more special. So you can see that here from this photograph and from the dress on the left, which was worn by Alice Landrum Wilkerson at her wedding to George Lofton Smith. George was registered for the draft on October 16, 1941. The couple was married one month later on November 20th, and he was enlisted as a private in the army just seven months after that in June of 1942. So while the suit is relatively simple, I would love to know where she managed to find the real leopard fur that was used to create the pockets on her jacket. I'm assuming she already had the fur because luxury fabrics were very highly regulated during the war. And you can tell that this was probably planned really quickly because of the suit. And you can see that her bridesmaid or her friend that was also in the ceremony or attending the wedding is also wearing a very simple suit. So at the opposite end of the spectrum is this dress, which was worn by Allie Kelly at her wedding to Oliver Barber on February 3rd, 1942. Alice, who was in the last slide, and Allie, their weddings were less than four months apart from each other, but the war had very dramatic uh, impacts on their wedding attire in very different ways. So while many women during this time period had opted for the wedding suit because of convenience, the traditional white satin wedding dress was still considered the standard if a bride-to-be had the time and the money to afford it. In fact, the bridal industry insisted that having a traditional wedding was a morale-boosting and patriotic act, and it was another way to support the troops in the dark period of history. Just funny that they could spend any way to make people spend money as like a patriotic duty even when we're told to make do and mend and to reuse items and to be conservative with those things. The bridal industry really knew how to get people to continue spending money on this kind of event. That being said, some modifications still had to be made. The War Production Board heavily restricted the amount and type of fabric available to civilians. Silk was nearly impossible to find as the lightweight, durable fabric was needed for parachutes. 
Fortunately, textile manufacturers had perfected a variety of man-made fabrics that were more readily available to consumers. Allie's dress is made of a white rayon satin, which is known as Duchess satin. And it's a really convincing substitute for the real thing. I actually just saw this dress for the first time a few months ago when it was um, donated and added to the collection. And the first few times that I looked at it and handled it, I thought it was silk. And it wasn't until I started doing this research that I realized that it was um, a man-made material and not actually silk. Um, because synthetic fabrics weren't as heavily regulated, she didn't have to make as many sacrifices in the design of the gown. The long sleeves, the full skirt, and the dramatic train that she has here would have been impossible to achieve if the dress were made just from rationed material. This dress, worn by Rosalie Shulman at her wedding to Lewis Herman, is also made from silk alternatives. Her underdress is also made from Duchess silk, and the lace overdress is made from several yards of either rayon or cotton netting with these large bands of floral lace, and it's cut in the classic 1930s, 1940s glam silhouette. Rosalie's dress is a special piece in our collection for more than just its beautiful design. It's the only known wedding dress in our collection that was made by a man, and one of only two wedding dresses that we have that belonged to Jewish women. Rosalie's dress was made by her father, Frank Schulman, who was a successful ladies tailor who lived and worked in Louisville in the first half of the 20th century. He worked for Kaufman Strauss department store before launching his own tailoring business, which he ran successfully for many years out of a few different stores on Bardstown Road in the Highlands. So in the top left corner of the slide, you can see that there's an advertisement for his business in the Courier Journal, which was published shortly after he left Kaufman Strauss. Rosalie and Lewis were married at Congregation Adith Jeshurun in the old location on Brook Street. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, the origins of wedding customs vary dramatically by religious affiliation, geographic location, and economic status. For women in much of the Western world, Queen Victoria's wedding dress was the catalyst for choosing to wear white. But Jewish women had actually been wearing white on their wedding day for more than 500 years before Queen Victoria did it. Both the bride and groom would wear white, and the color was thought to represent their good deeds that were done on earth. And I also read during my research that after Queen Victoria wore her white wedding dress and made it really popular amongst Christian women, um, many Jewish women began wearing off-white wedding dresses as a way to differentiate themselves from Christian brides. And of course, that's not a hard and fast rule, but I thought it was a really interesting tidbit of ways that these two different traditions kind of evolved with each other and against each other over the course of, you know, a couple hundred years. In the 20th and 21st centuries, as everyday wear and even formal and evening wear became more casual, bridal fashion had to look for new inspiration for its designs. And I do see this trend for more casual wear as a good thing, even though clothes today aren't as interesting to study as clothing from 100 years ago or 200 years ago, because it's, it's less of a craft and more of just like, it, it's serving different purposes other than being purely ornamental. Um, the rise of loose, comfortable, and less restrictive garments coincides with the expanding rights of women, as this type of clothing is better suited to a more active and independent lifestyle. That being said, this has led to a change in the bridal gown industry and where it's drawing its influences from. Wedding dresses inspired by earlier fashion periods, like the Victorian era, were popular in the 1950s and the 1980s. And then by the 1990s, many elite fashion designers like Oscar de la Renta and Vera Wang and Christian Dior, I think, and Chanel were all creating couture wedding gowns that were featured in their runway shows. So while not every bride is purchasing a Vera Wang gown today, um, many other designers have been pulling influence from the couture gowns you'd see at Fashion Week or maybe on the red carpet worn by some celebrity. And since there is so much variety in contemporary bridal wear, brides-to-be have a greater opportunity to pick a gown that reflects who they are and the way that they want to feel on their wedding day. 
So to demonstrate that, I pulled some photographs of brides who got married here at the Filson. Just in these six photos, you can see a really broad range in style. The woman on the top left is wearing kind of an old Hollywood glam style dress. The woman on the top right and the two in the bottom have a little bit more glamorous and extravagant, extravagant pieces with these really full skirts and long trains and have like some more fluff to them. And the woman in the middle is seen wearing a kind of understated and more like classic and simple silhouette. So without knowing any of these women, I feel like you can really get a sense of their personality and their individual style just by looking at their photos from their wedding day. So while we do have a wonderful collection of wedding dresses at the Filson, I wanna acknowledge that our collection is missing some important stories about life in the Ohio Valley region. We still have a lot of work to do to rep better represent communities of color and individuals from a variety of economic backgrounds. And I say that because we are actively collecting new pieces and we would love to acquire wedding dresses or learn more about other garments that help us fill these important gaps in our collection. If you have any questions regarding the collection or if you're interested in donating material, uh, please contact me at my email, which is listed here, or you can send us a message through our website. And if you're ever interested in seeing any of these dresses or other pieces in the museum collection in person, uh, you can contact our research library and we can try to set up an appointment for you to come in and do some research on any of these pieces in the collection. And we'll be fully reopening to the public on September 1st. So after that point in time, you're free to make any appointment to come see these pieces. And you can also come and see the two exhibits that we have in display on, our, uh, on display in our galleries. A Child's World will be in our Nash Gallery and Women at Work Venturing into the Public Sphere is in our Bingham Gallery. And if you've enjoyed this talk, you would definitely enjoy Women at Work because some of the dresses on display in that exhibit were made by Madame Glover, who we talked about a little bit today. And we have some other dresses that were made by Louisville dressmakers from the 19th and 20th centuries. And with that, that is the end of my presentation and I'll turn it back over to Patrick if uh, he has any questions. Thank you so much, Brooks. That was, that was really incredible. Um, I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about the, 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 the bigger clothing and textile collection that the Filson has. You mentioned the, the dresses that are up at uh, Women at Work. What else do we have? We have so many different things. It is hard to condense it into just a couple sentences. Um, as I mentioned, we've been doing inventory for three and a half years and we're two thirds of the way through the collection. I think we're on box number 164. Um, and so things that we found so far are um, a lot of wedding dresses and other um, evening wear and some day wear from 1816 up through the 1970s and 1980s. And we also have a lot of military uniforms. We have other men's garments and children's garments. We have a lot of accessories. So we've got a whole cabinet full of hats and shoes and fans and handkerchiefs and just lace. I think I've inventoried probably six boxes of just different pieces of lace. And so that kind of covers the clothing part of it. And the textile part is also very, um, very rich and has a lot of really interesting pieces. Maureen Lane did a talk two years ago on our quilt collection, and we have some really, really stunning quilts, as well as a lot of coverlets and um, counterpanes and some other textiles of that nature. So that kind of covers the bulk of what's in our collection. I know you had a tough time narrowing down your selections um, to, uh, to have in your presentation today. Um, I wonder if you could tell us what your favorite um, is here and maybe some of the ones that you would have liked to included, but you didn't have the time. Yeah, so I would say that my some of my favorites in the collection, I think the top one is still um, the one that was worn by Virginia Anderson, the, the bullet wedding dress that was worn by the great grandmother and the great granddaughter, um, just because it was, I think, the first wedding dress that we found. And I like, because I've done some like garment construction and some embroidery in my own personal practice. Um, 
just the amount of work that went into creating something that's entirely hand-sewn just kind of blew my mind. And where to start? There are so many wedding dresses um, that I wanted to include in this presentation. As I said, there's about 50 that we have in the collection and I only featured about 15 or 16. So we had several from, we had a bunch of dresses from the 1870s through the early 1900s. And we had a really great wedding dress from the 1930s and 40s. I was donated a few years ago that I really wanted to include, but I was like, oh, man, I already have so many wedding dresses from this time period. And so it's like, I really had to pick just one or two from each time period to try to feature. But a question about timelines and the evolution of production. Um, when roughly do you think that, um, that most wedding dresses stopped being produced in the home and then we started to see more professional dressmakers? So I would say that that kind of started around the time that the sewing machine became really popular. Um, at that time, there was the rise of the department store and the bridal industry really flourished around that time in the latter half of the 19th century. Um, all of these stores realized that they could make a ton of money off of selling bridal gowns and bridal trousseaus. And they even started to specialize in like every aspect of like wedding pieces that you would need. So they would have like a section for your silver and a section for ceramics. And so once that bridal industry really started to take off, I think you started to see a decline in dresses that were made in the home. But that being said, there were probably still a lot that were made by people of different economic backgrounds. It was usually a lot cheaper to have your dresses made in-house or if you couldn't afford a department store, you would maybe buy all the material and then give it to a local dressmaker and they would put it together for you. I really appreciated the ways that you wove in the stories about wedding practices and rituals and traditions in doing the research um, on these dresses. Did you find any, any traditions, rituals, superstitions that surprised you? Yeah, I found a ton. And there were some that I really wanted to include that were kind of outside of the scope of the talk because they didn't directly relate to wedding dresses. But my favorite ones were um, a tradition that was done by young unmarried women all the way up until like the 1960s and 70s. Um, instead of tossing a bouquet at the wedding, like the bride would toss a bouquet and then a single woman would try to catch it and that would be like the first person to get married. Um, women used to take a piece of the wedding cake and they would like slice off a little piece of it and then take it home and leave it under their pillow for like weeks and months at a time. And that was supposed to help them have sweet dreams and like dream about the man that they were gonna marry eventually, which like maybe cakes didn't like go bad as easily, but I just imagine that that would have like gotten very messy very quickly. Um, and then the other one that I thought was really interesting was um, we have the tradition today where you, as a bride is like entering or exiting the chapel, you would throw rice or like have sparklers or something to like lead the bride and groom out. But um, in the 19th century, it was really common to throw shoes at the bride and groom as they're like leaving or entering the chapel because um, this was meant to like knock evil spirits away that were trying to like get in and attack the bride and groom at this like transitional moment in their lives, which I don't know, sounds kind of dangerous. <laughs> I wanted to, to pull back and think a little bit about um, all of these dresses and our, our bigger um, clothing and textile collections as historical evidence. I think a lot of people, when they think about the Filson, they think about coming to read old books or manuscripts or letters or diaries or something like that. What different types of, of perspective on the past do we get when we're able to examine and sometimes even handle uh, these pieces? I think that being able to handle material culture like gives you a clearer window into what their life would have been like. Um, of course, reading a letter or a diary helps you get to know who the person was, but it's still kind of in the abstract. And so when you get to handle these physical objects, it really gives you a better idea of maybe who this person was. You can also see in a lot of the dresses in our collection, 
examples of where it may have been torn in some places or stained and you can see some mending. And by looking at those little details, you get a better idea of um, what they may have done in their life. For instance, if we have a dress that is like in pristine condition, is very beautiful and perfect looking, that probably belonged to someone who was of a higher economic background because they had um, the money to be able to purchase enough dresses that they could just wear it a couple of times and not have to worry about getting them stained or anything. And they could have these like pristine garments that other people would help launder and mend and maintain. But if you have a dress that has some more staining on it or has like very obvious mending, especially in multiple different places, it helps you understand that like, this is a very important dress to them. It was one that they wore several times and it was important enough that they felt the need to constantly repair it and like take care of it in that way. And even with all those efforts, there would still be some stains on it. And so that's like one example of how that would have been like another perspective on studying history. I thought you made a great point when you called out the, the lack of inclusivity and representation um, in, uh, in the, the dresses that we were able to present today. Um, thinking uh, ahead, going forward, uh, what sort of ways would you like to see our uh, fashion and textile collections grow? Where do we need to move next? So uh, Maureen Lane and I are still working on a solid plan of exactly how we want to prioritize new pieces coming into the collection. Um, but we're at a place now with inventory where we have a pretty good idea of who we have represented and the kinds of stories that we have. And so we're going to be taking a really detailed look at what we've already studied and inventoried so far and figure out which dresses we really want to keep, which stories we want to highlight, and identify any dresses we have that may be in really bad condition or not tell as complete of a story and uh, deaccession those artifacts as a way to make room for new pieces coming in. Um, I know that you, Patrick, and some of the other uh, members of our staff rewrote our collections policy recently, and we're really trying to focus on collecting in um, areas of our collection that we don't have represented as well. And so as we're looking at potential donations, we're really going to have like a, a more critical lens when we're looking at them to decide if like, if it is really an important dress based on those gaps. Of course, all the dresses that are being offered are important. That's, I'm not trying to say that like, oh no, that's like not good enough. It's just that we only have like a finite amount of space in our collection. And we really wanna make sure that we're leaving room for these room, like these pieces that we have never prioritized collecting in the past. Absolutely. So I feel like that leaves our door open for you to, to come back in a couple of years and report on how the collection has improved. I would love to. All right. I could spend all day talking about this collection. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brooks. This was incredibly enjoyable. Um, I know I learned a lot and the chat has been buzzing. Um, we really appreciate you sharing with us today.